Thank you for auditing the always positive New Music Review Show hosted by a French professor who is going to be really talking about that always positive bit. You see, I can feel and give a positive review of something which I don't particularly like. I'm, I'm going to explain why. I'm going to be talking about the album The Worm by HMLTD. Hamilton? Ham Limited? I don't know how to say their name. Hamilton? I'll just call them Hamilton for now. And it's, you might sort of be wondering, you know, how is that even possible? You know, because normally in my listening process, or listening process, if you're in England, in my listening process, I, I listen to the music, and then if I like it, then I figure out what I'm going to say about it. So how could I have dedicated myself to making a review of something which, at least on the first couple listens, I was, at times, I enjoyed it, and at times I was sort of enraged with how much I disliked it. Well, it's because it is a great work of art. No matter what I say about my personal preferences, this is a great work of art. It deserves to be treated seriously. You know, the reason I don't do negative reviews isn't because I don't like, you know, dunking on stuff, but it's hard enough to be an artist in this world, even at the top level. It's hard enough to be an artist without people jumping around and just taking a crap on you because you made a bad album. So I don't need to talk about... I don't know, the last Maroon 5 album, it doesn't matter, you know, who cares? It's not, for my, it's not for me, it's not for me, and it wasn't good either. But this is a weird case, and the reason why I'm going to end up reviewing this, there's two reasons. One, I got a lot of requests from my viewers, from my auditors, and my auditors in general have very good taste. Here you are. In general, if they say I'm going to like something, they're usually right. Matter of fact, they've never really been wrong. And the other part is... <laughs> I read the lyrics, I read their band camp, I read all about the album before I'd ever pressed play. You see, it was on Friday, and I had to go to a meeting on programmatic learning outcomes for scholarly year 2023-2024. One of these kinds of things you have to do when you're in any kind of administration in a university it is a total bummer. Just Fine, whatever, it's fine. it's fine. It's a fine meeting. I love my job. That's a hard part of my job, but it's fine just sitting in a room, sitting there. And so while I was there, I was paying attention. It's cool. The guy who was running the meeting was watching a baseball game secretly. He didn't know I was watching him. So, you know, you know, you all do it. You all go to a meeting. And so I'm sitting there and I'm reading this story. I'm reading this epic that they're putting forth before I've ever listened to it. Now, I should have known there was something up, because Hamilton's last album was called West of Eden. And you can see behind me, I have a copy of East of Eden. It's my favorite work of American literature, one of my favorite books in general. And so I remember when it came out, and like, why did I not review it? Like, that's like the greatest album title, West of Eden. Very clearly, like, these guys are kind of on my wavelength. And here's this whole epic work about a worm or about worms, and I'm totally there. So maybe I could have predicted that actually listening to the album would have been less pleasant for me than, than thinking about it. So I'll go through the album through that way, the process that I took, right? So it started off... I'm sitting there, I see the title, and I see the worm, and this, the first thing I read is that it's going to be about worms. And, and immediately, I start thinking about what are the psychological, what are the spiritual, the literary possibilities of worms. And I think it's intentional, and, and we'll talk about it, but you know, worms are often considered to be like the opposite of humans, you know, like the lowest form of life. And what makes humans so elevated primarily is, is pleasure, how we derive, you know, we're the only things that laugh, we're the only things, as far as we know, they're capable of complex emotions. Uh, sorry, that's my door locking. Uh, we're the only ones who are capable of locking doors, <laughs> of loving. We're the only ones who take pleasure in hunting. We're the only uh, beings that take pleasure in the sex act you know, the do it for sport. My wife tells me that primates do as well. So humans and primates, but we're just primates anyways. But most importantly, in what's come to take over, what has come to define the human existence isn't even our belief in God on this nice Easter. It isn't our belief in the divine. It isn't laughter. It isn't sex. It's consuming. That's what's come to define the human, right? Human, humanus consumerus, okay? That's who we are. So what I think this album is really getting at is by focusing on the image of a worm, a worm is the lowest being, but it is con entirely defined by its consumption. It is, and again, my, I was talking to my wife about this. She said there's all kinds of worms. I get it. 
There's all kinds of worms, but in general, we're all thinking about earthworms, you know, little, little pink guys, little green goblins, you know, little pink guys just kind of with no eyes. You know, as far as we know, they're blind and they don't, you know, it's not like they're eating out of pleasure. They eat anything. They eat without any kind of discrimination at all. They are sort of a funhouse mirror version of the human being who just completely consumes. So that, that's what's going on in my head before I even go to the band camp and read their description. So now I'm going to read the band's description of the album while annotating it, tying into whether or not they succeeded in what they are saying they were trying to do. Created over the course of two years with a cast of 47 musicians, that comes through. This album's very rich, very lush, very, very coordinated. It's a very coordinated album, including a gospel choir and a 16-piece string orchestra. The gospel choir's all over the place. The orchestra as well. String orchestra, that's the important part. It really is strings here. We're not hearing a lot of oboes or French horns. The Worm is less a concept album than a fully-fledged musical universe transcending genre and medium. I'm not positive on that. Set in a dis disorienting anachronistic version of medieval England, steeped in dystopian sci-fi fantasy as it is folklore and old English mythology, it's part political polemic, part deeply moving psychological journey, and finds frontman Henry Spichowski drawing on his own psycho-spiritual struggles to construct a modern parable about the impotence felt by individuals stuck inside gargantuan labyrinthine systems of power that they are powerless to change. So this really does get at the heart of what may be interested in this album because it's medieval England, but I think this is, a, again, it's sort of a comparing these extremes that in theory, you know, we live in the era that is the furthest from the medieval ages in terms of our progress, in terms of our understanding of the universe, in terms of our understanding of ourselves. So by sort of setting a modern parable in the Middle Ages, it's as though we are in those dark ages. And then this mythology, it is very political. It is very personal. That's what makes it such a great piece of art is it's, it's very aware of the fact that it is just one guy having this idea. And at certain points, you think he might be having a... He might have gone off the... He might be one crumpet short of a tea service. You know what I'm saying? Like, he really might not be all there. This might all be in his head. This might just be the ramblings of somebody in, in, a, in a psych ward, right? But really, it's that sense of powerlessness. And it's, it's the central image of this whole album is a worm that is eating, that is being eaten. And that the worm is the human and the human is the worm. All these sort of impossible M.C. Escher style uh, visual tableaus of worms and humans and eating. Henry, the lead singer guy, the leader of the worm people in the, in, the, in the album, we're told to believe that anxiety and depression are purely material and biological, like a parasitic worm that can be removed with the right treatment. I think that really these conditions reflect the world that surrounds us, like colonies that a far bigger worm has made inside of each of us. The psychological havoc wreaked by inescapable capitalist reality and the looming apocalypse it has created. So once again, we got some young people not comfortable with capitalism. I don't blame them. I'm not comfortable with uh, extreme free market capitalism and the way that it has uh, wreaked havoc on our society. Or what did he say? Wreak havoc. Uh, inescapable capitalist reality. Okay? So it is clear that this is a political album that's also sort of generally spiritual and a search for sort of meaning while understanding that in under capitalism we are all worms that are eating and being consumed so i love it it's great i, I love all that it's it's a good idea it's well executed. It's well said. I read the entire lyrics before I ever listened. All the lyrics work well. Has an interesting beginning, middle, and end. What happened? Why am I not saying that I love listening to this? Well, the issue is, it's kind of a musical. So, it's personal taste. I was traumatized by having to watch my high school's rendition of Jesus Christ Superstar, okay? Uh, I imagine watching Jesus Christ Superstar is always difficult. You know, it's always something that people have to go through, something that is inflicted upon people, not something that they choose to have happen to them. Uh, I can just tell you that it was the worst thing I've ever seen. And apologies to all the great friends of mine who are in that show, but it's the worst thing I've ever seen. The music, the singing, the performance, the concept, everything about Jesus Christ Superstar offended me as deeply as it possibly could. The the play could it could have been a high school play 
called Hey Sky, You Suck. And I would have been like, yeah, you know, they made some good points, but I just hated it. And, and ever sort of since then, I've tried to come to terms. Speaking of Hamilton Limited, which I guess is the name of this band. Speaking of Hamilton Limited, I, you know, uh, I listened to Hamilton. I like West Side Story. I went to Phantom of the Opera and enjoyed it. You know, I've, I've come around, right? But still, the issue is there's a little part of me that's kind of this rock snob, you know, that, that sort of musical theater is being sort of the lowest form of theater and the lowest form of music. Now, that's not true, okay? These are my prejudices that are coming through how I interpret this album. I, and, and this nuance is going to be lost on a lot of you, and that's fine. Um, but it's a really important one to say, you know, that m the part of me that doesn't like this album isn't right. It's immature, it's stuck in this mode of thinking musicals are bad, rock operas are good. I mean, <laughs> there's a fine line in my mind between Tommy and Tommy. You see, there's Tommy and Tommy. Tommy the album, ah, delightful. You know, uh, <laughs> the whole thing. I'm free. I'm free. Great. Awesome. Wonderful. Beautiful album. Beautiful theory. And then there's Tommy, the musical that came out in the 90s, where they took everything that was cool and rock and roll and just flattened it into a Broadway schlock fest. But it's a very fine line between musical and rock opera. And the reason that this album turned me off and I'm not even sure if it fully has turned me off because I've listened to it now four times and each time I like it more, I might end up thinking this is Tommy and not Tommy, you know? Because it, it falters between rock opera, which is not for everybody either. A lot of people don't like rock operas, you know? Between rock opera and musical theater. So let me give you an example of all this in one song, the title track, The Worm. So, this, this, I'm going to take a while to describe this song. I'm going to go through the rest of the album super quick. Before that, though, smash the like bucket. Um, subscribe. Uh, don't hit the bell. That seems ridiculous. I, I upload like three to five times a week, so just always check me out. You know what? Go ahead. Hit the bell. Why not? And, and leave a comment, because I imagine you might be upset that I'm telling you I don't like this album that much. That's fine. You can tell me you're upset. So, The Worm. It starts off with the sound of chanting. You know, again, we think about the great traditions of rock opera. I'm thinking of Pink Floyd's The Wall. In a way, the lead singer's name is Henry. He is playing a sort of messianic figure in a similar way that Roger Daltrey played Tommy uh, or that, uh, was it Waters who played Pink in, in uh, The Wall? I think it was. Well, I mean, I know it was, uh, what's his name, the Live Aid guy who played him in the movie. But you, the, the basic idea, that the lead singer is the star of the story. And in both those cases, they become messianic figures. And here we have Henry being chanted his name. You know, And when they play this in concert, you know, what you, Bob Geldof, in the concert, you'll have to imagine that everyone's going to be screaming it. And then there's this like energetic, nervous strings and some drums over this speech. And he gives this speech. Today, I proclaim that a worm has swallowed England. And despite what I, you have been told, it is not of a face nor spine nor legs. Does it want your jobs, your women or your cattle sheds? The worm lives deep within yourselves and you live deep within the worm. Hatred is the worm. Envy is the worm. Ego is the worm. So the worm here is seen as being not an external force, but an internal force. Maybe it's a tapeworm. Then we get this full choir over staccato strings. Seriously, this is an amazing piece of work. It really is, you know? Like, I wish my dad were still alive because this is one of those kinds of albums where I would imagine I could play it for him and he would sort of get into this sort of theory and kind of play with it and, and, and work through it and we could talk about it together, you know? Um... We'll break God's rib to make a scythe and carve our way out of his cage into the light. Now here, the, the worm becomes like a god, and you have to break one of his ribs to carve it out. The size of the worms is elastic. It's one thing I like about the art of this album is that it can't, even though I'm saying it sounds like a musical, you couldn't actually represent it musically because everything exists in a sort of quantum, you know, double state. 
right? Every, every worm is very small and very big. Every worm is consumed and consuming always at the same time. Then the strings that were staccato, you know, ding, 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 become legato. And very soon, no crops could grow, no seeds be sown. All the while, the acid in the belly rose and rose and rose and rose. So now we're having this image of people in England, people in the world, you know, being consumed by this acid of the stomach of the worm. Then there's this really cool bit where the guitar and voice come on, and it's very clearly intentionally echoing the doors. It's echoing Jim Morrison. And when you meet the worm, you must kill the worm. You know, it sounds like Riders on the Storm. It sounds like the end. It has that kind of feeling. And this has to be totally intentional. By the way, total side note, Dana Gould, very funny comedian. He once said, you can read every single lyric by uh, Jim Morrison in the voice of Fred Schneider from the B-52s. And it works. <laughs> and it's very funny. <laughs> There's a killer on the road. His brain is worrying like a toad. Yeah, it's very funny. Anyways, you must meet the worm. You must kill the worm. So we had this cool moment with the guitar. It sounds like the doors. And it sounds all cool. And then it just gets so musically. It just, even the way the guitar is played, it sounds like the kind of guitar that's played when someone's imitating a rock sound when they're in a musical orchestra. You know, and the singing with this choir and the organ and the strings. We were born deep in the belly of a great worm, of a worm that swallows worlds, of a worm with no way out, of a worm in everybody, and we're living in the belly of a worm inside the man, and the man's inside the worm. You know, always, constantly, you can't actually imagine what's happening because everything's inside of itself. It's an Ouroboros. It's more than Ouroboros. It's just a, it's a consuming, consumed thing at all times, which, of course, is the parable of the modern human, right? The modern human is constantly consuming and being consumed, right? Uh, like we are being consumed and, and I just said that again. I was trying to make it more clear what I mean. I, you get what I mean, though. So we're all good. Then there's like a weird part with not time signature. Again, the ambition on this album is, is crazy. Just the choir and low strings chugging along. All these nice little production details, guitar, and the drum goes to a little ride cymbal, which is nice. Little change, great drumming throughout. Father, are we wretched? Are men no more than just worm gods? Aren't our bodies like them, soft and pink and feeding off the corpse of the earth? We are worm god, we are worm god, man is worm god. So this is interesting, you know, it's tying into the, you know, the pinkness you know, least of, of, uh, of white people. And white people are very pink. That's our sort of defining color. We like to think that it's white, but it's not white. It's not bronze, you know, it's pink. Look at that. I mean, how much pink do I got going on here? Beyond my vampire bites. I gotta I got talk about vampire, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, you know, like we're very pink. So we are like the worms in that way and we're feeding off the corpse of the earth. And this could be a parable about global warming. The whole thing could be about global warming. I kind of hate and love all things about global warming. And then we get that same thing about needing to kill the worm, but now this lead singer has gone from Jim Morrison to full preacher, the way that he started. Like this is that messianic Henry, just like the messianic Pink Floyd, just like the messianic uh, who, you know, and then there's a bit with like a, the chorus comes back and there's like a queen style guitar over organ and the belly of the worm that swallows worlds and then ends this very high scream. And then we have a bridge with a descending melody that's just this gorgeous descending melody. I cross my heart and hope to die. I tie the rope in hopes it works this time. It looks just like the worm that's haunted me through all my life. And then we get a moment of just strings playing a descending arpeggio but they get louder. And my life flashed before my eyes to simpler times. I was just a child. And then this curling guitar comes in, gets plucked, and all of a sudden, he's having these memories of his childhood in a very sort of Proustian way. And playing football with my father in the garden, I could hear my mother calling us for tea. I kicked, and then the ground fell beneath my feet, and I saw worms. He's sort of connecting to the first time he saw worms. These worms have these sort of symbols and this meaning to him. And then at this point, it gets into full Bernard Herman score for Psycho. Okay? And then the chorus comes back, but this time it's sung in like a post-punk style. And this is where I love it. Like, his voice is so dynamic. He does so many things. I don't know why half the time he sings in a way that makes me want to gouge my ear balls out, but it's okay. We were born deep in the belly of a great worm, uh, of a worm that swallows worlds, uh, of a worm with no way out, uh, 
of a worm called capital. The only time in the album, as far as I can tell, where he talks about capitalism directly, that he's really putting a point on it, that it's because of capitalism that we are a worm that is consuming a worm that is consuming a worm that is being consumed by a worm being consumed by another worm. A breakdown, kill yourself to kill the worm inside you. You know, the only way out of this whole system is to just not exist because the system is all-consuming. Die a man or live to see yourself become a worm god like me. Here's the state of humanity. We are worm gods. There's a sound over there. So my windows are rotted out in the front of my house. <laughs> and there's these little sparrows that are like trying to make a nest in the rotted out wood. So you're going to hear that sound. That doesn't have to do with worms specifically. But I think it's a good metaphor for, uh, I don't know the difficulty of keeping yourself safe or the way that nature eventually takes over. I don't know. I'm going to go through the rest of the album much quicker. Opens up with the track. War oh, and by the way, that last song, The Worm, I love that song. <laughs> so I don't know. I almost bought this album without even having listened to it because it comes with a book. You can buy it and it comes with a book and it comes signed. Like all the things that I like as a collector. Like... <laughs> I wanted to like this album so much more than I did, but then I listened to that song again. And this is what happens is you end up sort of forgiving the musical bits because the rest of it's just so delightful. So Worm's Dream is how the album starts. The very thin voice, the, I think it's even a female voice. It might not be Henry. Joined by other people, becomes a cascade of noise, almost a free jazz opening, hard drumming, and then the worm is killed. And then there's a children's chorus and it leads directly into the next song, Worm Lands, which breaks into almost a beat that reminds me of New York State of Mind, by Nas, boom, 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 boom. almost like Primus, you know, was playing the bass line. And the way it's sung is very similar to a, an underground artist who I like quite a bit, Patricia Taxon. I don't know if you've ever heard Patricia Taxon's music, but the way that he's singing here is a lot like the way she sings. Uh, and then there's like a Bowie bit here. The way that they sing reminds me of Bowie. And then I realized there's a chance that I will love the worm. There's a chance that it is the most logical follow-up to the album Outside by David Bowie from 1995. This is a top five David Bowie album for me. Okay? That's how good this album is. Okay? David Bowie has a lot of underrated albums and a couple overrated albums. Aladdin Sane? It's not, not a great album. But the cover's great, but the album itself, eh. But some of his later work, like Outside, this, if you've never heard Outside, please give yourself, give yourself the treat of, of listening to it. It's this bizarre, kind of failed, successful murder mystery, art crime, musical, rock opera about this figure who's like a serial killer and not, and the music's so good. But a lot of the flaws that this album has are things that I don't like, are things I didn't like when I first heard Outside. When I first heard Outside by David Bowie, I thought it was trash. I thought it was musical. I thought it was, what's the fuss? What's it all about? What's the fuss? Uh, you know, but it comes with these, this booklet. And all these, you know, descriptions and all this kind of like 90s stuff. I'm going to do a video sometime, actually. I'm going to do a full, a full breakdown video of Outside as to why it's such a great album. So when I hear this kind of Bowie-like singing on this song, it makes me realize, hey, maybe that's what they're doing. Maybe I need to be more forgiving. I don't know. And then goes back to that crazy bass lead, full musical sounding chorus. But then there's also some cool, like, modern production tricks of, like, chopping stuff up. This is Wormland, Population U. I'm pretty sure that's a Simpsons reference. Welcome to Dumpsville, Population U. Um, <laughs> watch the worms, F in the mud like a mirror. Why am I pink? Why am I blind? I, I like this image very much. This is the question of the human condition. Why am I pink? Why am I blind? They use the word sus, 2023. Uh, the end is now. It starts off with this children's chorus, cut up sounds. We we're born in the war of the worms and... Then we get to this ridiculously, this is that kind of singing voice that just drives me crazy. It sounds like musical theater. But then the guitar work behind is quite nice. And the, the ending engagement is nice. The end is now, there's a fire in this house. It's burning down, leaving without a sound. There's a fire in this house, burn me inside out. I think this is pretty clearly about the nature of 
the state of our environment and the, the difficulties that we are in with our environment and the fact that our house is burning down from the inside. I do like this big, this larger theme constantly that the threats that we're facing are inside, that the threat of global warming is actually an inside problem. It's like a thing that we created and it's a thing that we're doing to ourselves. It's like we are all inside this world and we are burning the house down from inside out. Next track is called Days. Nice. Here his voice is super charismatic with a little piano. It builds with a second voice and then strings and I love there's like a female voice on here or he's singing up very high. It's really nice. I remember yesterday Torquay Harbor in the rain, but all the while this thing was growing deep inside me. It's eating me, still eating me, indicating that there's worm, that he can't even enjoy his life because it's showing up. I just like that lyric because he says Torquay. And if you're an American like me, Torquay means one thing, faulty towers. That's all I think about. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> eventually, that's all I think about. Uh, and I like thinking about Faulty Towers because, you know, England's made a lot of good stuff. Next song is called Saddest Worm Ever. And this is funny because it has this cool, like, metronomy sound of, like, a beep. And the drums here, it's very in Rainbow's Radiohead-ish. This reminds me a lot of Weird Fishes, especially the drummer, and then at a certain point, arpeggio comes in. Um, this is and there's maybe the high of the album is this instrumental part where these, they have all this intersecting music that's so interesting. The, the drums are behind. There's like a fuzzy guitar solo and like a fuzzy bass, and there's these two clean guitar lines that intertwine with each other, and it's very nice. Power gets you high. Power gets you high. Eat, 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 eat. Flash, 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 flash. Cow, chicken pig human what's the difference ends with this musical thing here it even sort of reminds me of the very end of the song burn the witch by radiohead and there's even a guitar line which reminds me strongly of the guitar line from third uh third stone from the sun uh by Jimi hendrix kind of has that sort of grand epicness to it Next one is Liverpool Street. Here's where we start to wonder the entire narrative. You know, it's clear that we have what is called in literary analysis an unreliable narrator. Dear listener, Mr. Henry Spachowski is exhibiting extremely volatile behavior. There's a confluence of longstanding abandonment and objection issues. He has made the worm. He has to kill the worm. So here we're really in this whole zone. Sorry, you hear, you hear the birds? We're in the zone. It really does remind me the most of the, of the wall. Now that I'm thinking about it. Because the wall is a very similar thing where it's somebody whose personal trauma is forcing him to behave in a certain way. And the way that that behavior is told is a intentional reflection of society itself. So it's an internal, external kind of thing here. Like he made the wall, so he has to take down the wall. By the way, the wall, you might not know this. It's a disco album. You're welcome. You might not have known that, but now you do. Especially, especially the hits. We don't need no education. <laughs> Great tuning of violins in the back here has the sort of sense of scope here, piano, the pulsing sound. Here his voice is gorgeous and doesn't annoy me at all. He talks about the Petri dish as the one person who can kill the worm, just constantly having to kill the worm if you make it. Then we get to the stamp the worm, which I've already discussed. Then we get to past life, parentheses, cinnamon song. This is my least favorite song on the album. This is the song that makes me want to punch out my earballs the most. Um, more of that kind of tuning orchestra. I do think that rock bands tend to include tuning orchestras a lot when they include orchestras because it sounds so cool and they're not used to it. <laughs> uh, the way that he sings, in a dream you found a way. Just the way he sings those lines, it's, it's, it, it puts me back in the pants. Like I'm back, I'm back watching Jesus Christ Superstar in Belmont High School in 1993. Okay. Who played Jesus? I think it was Mark Schmidt. He was good. He was good. Like they were good. It's just the material is so bad. A friend of mine played like a Roman. <laughs> so, so I had to go. That was the problem. I had to go. I had to support my friends. 
Anyways, uh, tell me how to keep the faith. Just going on and on about the question of faith and worms. But then, like, there's other parts I like. Like, I like the way that he sings, keep the faith without judgment. And that idea is interesting, keep the faith without judgment. There's a bass solo. And together, the ants will conquer the elephant. Together, a man walking hand in hand will conquer the worm. Set fire to this cathedral of hatred that we lust. Cool kind of bleary organ. And then there's, like, the story about a cat who brings in a worm in two pieces and it goes off and you're like wait this is where you get the sense that maybe this entire thing happened when this lead singer guy like his cat brought in a worm that's your fault for having a cat but you know what i mean like that's a that's a fun detail that makes you think that this might all just be a reverie the album ends with lay me down weird pitched up vocals the sun is a death star death star uh the voice has some like I don't know, fluidity here? It's very nice. I've got no end. Lay me down. My only friend. This leads still nowhere. I pretend. Lay me down. Just like God meant. This ties into the basic idea. There's even like a little bolero rhythm in here. Nice guitars. Kind of a triumphant ending. A triumphant guitar solo. And of course, what comes for us at the end of our life. What happens at the end of our life? We are eaten by the worms. These are my Patreons. I actually still might buy this album. <laughs> the more I talk about it, the more I like it. I don't know if I'll ever get over the way he sings some of those lines, though. So I'm not quite sure. I'll have to, have to see it. So thank you to them for maybe giving me the money to maybe buy this album. Which, again, is a great piece of art that maybe is just not to my taste. Two more things about worms. I play Pokemon, Pokemon Go, every day. And uh, my family, for some reason, all of their names have to do with worms. So I like that. Next thing, Weird Fishes. One of my favorite songs by Radiohead. You probably already know. I sang, my son, when he was two years old, sang a version of Weird Fishes. We put it on YouTube. It did quite well. And I try to get him to say, you know, uh, what song are we going to sing? Weird Fishes. Bye. I'm trying to get him to say, by Radiohead. <laughs> but instead, I go, Weird Fish. What song are we going to play? Weird Fishes. Bye. By the worms, because that's the lyric. So, anyways, I also like worms. Speaking of worms, I hit a whole bunch, I mean, an Easter bunny hit a whole bunch of uh, Easter eggs out there. So hopefully they're not being eaten by the worms. All right, till next time, there's a camera.